I know Alexei Navalny. I don't know him well, but I've known him for a long time. He said some really stupid things, things that I categorically disagree with. Putin is super paranoid about the West, and he pointed right at me, he stared right at me, where he stared right at me and he said, I know what you're doing and we are going to stop you. I want to be honest, it was, it was kind of scary to have Putin stare at you that way. But if he, God forbid, dies in jail, that means that forever the country of Georgia will be remembered for that one fact. They'll be remembered as the guy that put their previous president in jail and killed them. I believe that all billionaires uh, in Russia uh, should be on the sanctions list. Hello, Ambassador. Am I uh, supposed to call you Ambassador? Yeah, because there are no former ambassadors, right? We we are talking. You can uh, call me Michael. You can call me whatever uh, you want. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, nice hi, to meet you. Good to yeah. see you, Mikhail. Good to see you. Yeah, same here. We are speaking uh, just a couple of days after uh, the Oscars ceremony when um, the film about Alexei Navalny was awarded with with an Oscar for the best documentary. Uh, and basically, we I think we both consider it to be a very political event like unlike most of our scores this one is uh has very political uh, symbolism uh do you think that uh that could be important for russian opposition and that uh, do you think that 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 word could somehow help alexei navalny uh to be out of prison those are hard questions i don't have easy answers um i just want to say on a personal level i i saw the film i went to its um opening in San Francisco. Uh, I saw it, by the way, with uh, Dasha Navalnaya, who's a student here at Stanford. So we were there together and she spoke afterwards. And I think it's just as a documentary, as a piece of art, as a piece of, of, of you know, uh, film content, it's a very powerful film. It's a very well done film. And so I want to urge people to see it before you judge it. That's the first thing. Uh, second, I, just to remind everybody, uh, the Oscar or organization doesn't pick who wins. It's a vote. Uh, thousands of people cast their votes. Uh, there's been some controversy uh, among some Ukrainian critics that somehow the Oscar organization picked it for political purposes. And everybody just needs to know that people voted, thousands of people voted, uh, and it wasn't just some cabal that decided this. Uh, third, I hope it helps uh, at least to keep Alexei Navalny alive. I'm worried about him dying in prison. Uh, and so I hope that this award and this recognition and, and greater understanding of his story will, at, at a minimum, uh, give him better treatment uh, in prison. Uh, and yes, it would be fantastic if he was released, but I, I'm not anticipating that. Um, I know a little bit about Mr. Putin, not as much as you do, uh, but I've had my uh, encounters with him and I've written about him and I've, I've watched his career. And I would be very surprised if somehow uh, he was released. I mean, things happen. Uh, I, I was part of the negotiations and contra uh, conversations about the release of Mikhail Khodorkovsky. I remember very vividly uh, writing talking points for President Obama to present to President Medvedev when they met uh, several times where they discussed the release of Hartikovsky. Uh, that eventually happened, uh, really, and thanks in large measure to Angela Merkel and their mediation, not ours. So it can happen. I'm, I just don't predict it. Um, I would uh, like to be more hopeful, but I'm not hopeful. Yeah, it's it's very interesting that the, the comparison you've made. Uh, what's the difference? Why why was it possible for for Putin and and uh, and Medvedev to release Khodorkovsky? And why uh, do you, do you think that's unlikely uh, that that Putin could uh, release uh, Navalny now? Well, the discussions about Khodorkovsky um, went on for years and years. Right, we only came in at the end of it. Um, uh, I'm just, you asked me for my explanation. I don't know the actual mm -hmm. answer, but, mm -hmm. but the release, and, and we met many times. I, I, I Actually, I don't think I've ever talked about this publicly before, but President Obama 
uh, spoke about this issue many times with President Medvedev. In fact, there was one moment at one of their meetings, I think it was in Yokohama, if I'm not mistaken, um, where Medvedev had already left the meeting and Obama had forgot to pull him aside to talk about Hartikovsky. And we had to run down the stairs to intercept Medvedev on his way out because Obama had one more thing he wanted to talk about with him. And so he mm -hmm. went back up the 12 floors and then they just talked one-on-one -on -one about Hartikovsky's release. Um, it happened right before the Sochi Olympics, as I remember it. And I remember it as a way to, you know, create a better atmosphere for the Sochi Olympics and uh, a very senior uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs official uh, pulled me aside one day to basically signal that that's what they were trying to do. Um, so if you think about today, we don't, we're in a much worse moment in Russia's relationship with the world. Uh, they're not inviting us all to a great party to celebrate Russia. Uh, so tragically, that moment doesn't exist. Um, and I would also say, you know, let's not forget, uh, Mr. Hodokovsky served tw 10 years in prison. I mean, uh, horrific years in prison. Uh, that's a long, long time. Um, I think after that, uh, the Kremlin uh, decided that he was less of a threat. Uh, and remember, I don't know if this was a condition of his deal. I don't remember the, the details. But one of the conditions, you know, Mr. Hartikovsky, as you know well, uh, does not live in Russia today. He lives in exile. Um, and that is a condition that Mr. Navalny, he was, he was offered that possibility. And he chose to go back to Russia because he did not want to live in exile so I'm not sure that he would accept that condition. Um, and then the third and related thing I would say is uh, I'm not an expert on Russian politics anymore. I used to be, but I don't claim to be anymore. Uh, I've been on the sanctions list for a long time. Uh, but there's no opposition leader that threatens Mr. Putin uh, in a greater way than Alexei Navalny. Uh, and that's therefore I don't predict that he would be uh, released. Um, much lesser figures, uh, tragically, have been arrested recently because of pa Putin's paranoid thinking about the world. So I, I just don't see the short-term circumstances under which Putin might have the brave, uh, be brave enough to release Alexei Navalny. You've mentioned of a, of a scandal that, uh, that that happened after the the awards ceremony, and uh, recently I, I've seen uh, your tweet. Uh, you were obviously um, um, not happy uh, about the criticism towards you, and, uh, and there, there was a particular tweet from uh, from a user from Estonia uh, who uh, wrote that um, you were an apologist for for Navalny and you were part of the problem, and you you st you started responding because normally you 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 don't always res respond to. To, to yeah to criticism this 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 was yeah <laughs> yes yeah explain explain <laughs> explain I, and by the way I've been attacked not just by that Estonian troll but but by people directly interacting with me personally mostly from Ukraine mm -hmm. and saying Mike how could you celebrate uh, this award for this Russian imperialist um, and that people are very disappointed with me just just so you know. Um, and it's, I got to tell you, honestly, it's, it's frustrating this world I live in where I feel like I'm trying to do what I can to stop Putin's invasion and occupation of Ukraine. Uh, I don't think there's anybody more vocal in America about more weapons and more sanctions. And I say that on TV. I say it on Twitter. I say it when I meet with White House officials. Uh, and yet I'm also criticized for being, you know, supportive of, of Russians and and I want to I want to be sensitive in the way I answer this. In that, um, I understand my Ukrainian colleagues and friends who, because of this horrific war, just this horrible, awful war where kids are being killed, they're being kidnapped. People are dying, cousins are dying, brothers are dying all the time. These are people I know personally, right? 
Some of them I've known for decades. I understand that they have a right to be angry at all Russians. Uh, and, and I understand that. Um, at the same time, uh, I don't, I don't share the view that, um, every single Russian is guilty for this war in Ukraine. Uh, I, unlike, and I want to be honest, Mikhail, I didn't have this view a year ago. I've changed my views on this. I think Russians collectively, not collectively, but individually have to think about their personal responsibility for this war and not just say it's Putin's war. Um, and and I'm also guilty. I'm, I'm part of this guilt. Uh, I was part of an American NGO that came to Russia in the 1990s to build democracy with our Russian friends. Uh, we failed. I personally failed. That's that's on me. That's a failure. We did not stop Putin. Uh, the Russian opposition did not stop Putin. Um, you know, we can talk about whether they could or not. Russian, but I think Russian we, independent media didn't stop Putin as well. Yeah. And Russian independent media I agree. didn't stop Putin too. We, so we are all somehow, uh, we have to own that failure. Um, mm -hmm. I most certainly do personally. Um, it doesn't mean that that you know we have to go to jail or you know uh, we have to suffer, but but we have we have a we have a responsibility for th that he's in power because I didn't want him That's to true. be in power and That's I true. failed. So um, uh, and 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 therefore I want people all over the world, uh, not just Russians, but but Russians inside Russia, outside Russia but Georgians and Americans and Belarusians and, and everybody to try to do more to try to stop this horrific war. Uh, every day we have to think, what can we do more? At the same time, uh, I do not believe that that calling Mr. Navalny an imperialist uh, and, and spending all this time attacking Navalny is useful to stopping Putin's war. Um, I know Alexei Navalny. I don't know him well, but I've known him for a long time. He said some really stupid things, uh, things that I categorically disagree with. And I've had the ability to argue with him about those things. But the, but the, the war changed his mind a lot. And he, everything he's saying after the beginning of the war is completely different. Exactly. Exactly. And, and what, what, what you can see how emotional I'm getting, right? What, what drives me nuts about these debates, including about, about me, is people should have the ability to change their mind, and then people should acknowledge that. Uh, so people are talking about what I wrote about 20 years time. I'll just make it about me. I'll let Mr. Navalny speak for, him, for himself from a prison cell where he doesn't have the ability to speak for himself. But, but you know, I wrote something 20 years ago and somebody says, gotcha. Well, you said this 20 years ago. Well, I've changed my mind. That to me, as a scientist, as, a, as an academic, as a professor, that's the field I'm in. If you're still arguing the same things you believed 20 years ago, you're not doing scientific work, right? Mm -hmm. But that should be true in political life too, that you should have the um, authority to change your mind. And there's no doubt on my mind that Alexei Navalny, has changed his mind and he's taken great risks to publish what he believes now about this war. And, and we should have the grace to acknowledge that, number one. And number two, when we're fighting on Twitter about is Alexei Navalny an imperialist or not, you know who we're not fighting with? We're not fighting with Vladimir Putin. And so we are doing exactly what he wants. Uh, and, you know, when when Doge TV is attacked for this or that uh, on the outside, we're doing exactly what Putin wants. When Benediktov and Leonid Volka are fighting, and I don't even know all those details, but when they're clashing with each other, that is a victory for Vladimir Putin. And I've just, we've got to get away from that. Uh, you're um, famous now uh, as the co-chair of so-called uh, your Mark McFall Commission. So you are dis you are discussing uh, the sanctions against Russia on a like I don't know daily, weekly basis. Uh, so what's what's your take on the famous or infamous I must say Friedman case, uh, uh, Alexei Volkov and uh, 
Le Leonid Volkov and a number of people uh, um, who wrote a letter in in favor of um, Mikhail Friedman to be to be released out of sanctions. What's your take on that? So let me say one uh, just point of clarification. Um, uh, I am formally the coordinator of the International Working Group on Russian Sanctions. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ukraine, it's it's referred to as the Yermak McFall Working Group, but but for reasons yeah. of, of clarity, that's, that's not a formal. Right. Yeah. But just for reasons of clarity, and it's important because I want to be clear, uh, I, I'm independent. I don't work for the Ukrainian government. Uh, I don't work for the mm -hmm. American government. And our group, we just write papers and then we send them to people and then people react to them. So uh, that's just I need to say that just for people to understand. But but I work closely with Mr. Yermak. You're right. I tragically, uh, Misha, I, I deal on this issue every single day, not every week. Uh, it, it consumes a lot of my time, not not tragically, importantly, but it's just it's a it's a giant um, amount of work. Uh, here's what I would say: uh, I haven't seen the letter. Maybe you've seen it. I have not actually seen the letter that people sent uh, in defense of Mr. Avin and, and Friedman. Um, maybe it's in the press. I haven't seen it, but I, I have uh, thought about this. I've talked to both of them over the months. I, I used to know them when I was ambassador. Um, I I believe that all billionaires uh, in Russia uh, should be on the sanctions list. I think they should all be on the sanctions list. I th find this idea that this is a good one and this is a bad one. I don't understand how you can make those decisions, right? Like, I, I don't think Yevtushenkov is on the list. So why is he not on the list? I, I don't understand. I think he is. I think oh, he, no, is. he is. Well, he's on some, he's on others. There's like some confusion about, but I just, I, my attitude is, uh, put them all on. Um, and then, then establish some criteria for getting off the list. Because the problem with sanctions today is once you're on there, there's virtually no mechanism for getting off. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think that's right. I think there should be a mechanism uh, that, that if you change your behavior, uh, that you, you there should be somebody that can adjudicate that. In the case of, of, of large uh, multi-billionaire oligarchs with big business in Russia, uh, my personal view is they should be allowed to get off. But here's the conditions, and I want to be very clear: these are my. Should, it, should they pay? Should they pay like uh, all yes. of their or part yeah. of their uh, yes. assets to Ukraine? Yes. So, the, uh, but I need to underscore: this is my personal view mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. many people on my working group do not agree with me. Uh, in fact, we wrote a paper about it, and we didn't have agreement. So this is just my personal view, not and Mr. Yermak. Let him speak for himself. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, one, you need to denounce the war and Mr. Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Two, you need to transfer. I think it should be 90% of your assets uh, and your wealth uh, to a Ukrainian reconstruction fund. Three, you need to divest from Russia. So those are really high bars. But but if you want to live comfortably in the West, uh, to me, there that's a, that those are those that those are criteria that that you could you could pursue. And I want to underscore: nobody agrees with me. Uh, the oligarchs don't agree with me. Uh, <laughs> the Ukrainians don't agree with me. Uh, so I, it's just my view. But but that's my view. Several months ago, I've I've heard an idea, and I think that it was. Initiated by uh, by people from Fabeka, uh, from uh, the Valley Circle, uh, that uh, the good criteria to um, to, um, to make new sanctions against Russian elite uh, is the membership in the United Russia. So if why why not sanction all and and that ha that hasn't happened. It was being discussed, but it has never happened. What's the problem? What what do you think of of that uh, criteria? So I haven't seen what the Navalny group published on that, but our group did publish a paper on that very issue uh, nine or 10 months ago, a long, long time ago. And, and what we did in that paper, and um, it's on our website here at the Freeman Spogli Institute for people who want to find it. Um, what we said is we should sanction positions, not just individuals. And, and, 
And on our list, it's a very long list. We should sanction everybody in United Russia, everybody in all the other parties that support the war, uh, everybody in local government, uh, everybody who's a board member of state-owned enterprises inside Russia. Uh, and I, it, but, but it was all positions, right? Um, and then we give people a choice rather than you just get on the list and you can't get off. If, if you're in United Russia, you're, you're going to be on the sanctions list. Uh, but if you resign, then you're no longer on the list. Uh, so I 100% Re agree resign, with the idea. Resign and denounce the war. Denounce the war. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, but the argument we hear from governments, why they haven't done that, is I, I hear enthusiasm for the idea, uh, but they don't feel like they have the capacity uh, to monitor uh, the tens of thousands of names that that would require. But I think the concept is a good one. I think we should keep supporting it. I've heard several times from, from different uh, sources uh, in Moscow that occasionally um, uh, many people in, in Russian political elite think that the time is on their side. That uh, it's okay, they, they can wait, they have time, uh, because probably um, as the time passes, uh, the international and especially American support uh, towards Ukraine can fade away. Especially they are thinking about the next November, um, when something could change. Uh, November next year, I mean. Uh, what do you think um, of that? I think that it's it's a bit too far, like it's a too too bold prediction. But the, there is a fear that um, Russian elites are waiting and Americans can change their mind. Uh, it's a fear I have too. Uh, they they're they're hoping for it. It's a fear I have, right? There, it's hope for them. It's fear for me. Um, but let me say two things. Uh, if if we're talking about Russian economic elites, uh, they I think they're mistaken. Uh, sanctions are super sticky. Um, and as long as uh, Putin's government hasn't paid for reparations and done, you know, 12 other things that the Ukrainians want them to do, uh, sanctions will remain in place, even if the war ends. Uh, so I think they are mistaken. That particular group of people, they're mistaken. But but Putin might not be mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. and, and he... I, I I feel it in my country that um, uh, there's a new debate, especially inside the Republican Party, as you rightly pointed out, or you hinted at, um, that are thinking, why are we spending so much money there? We have problems here at home. Mr. Trump, as you know, is already declared as a candidate, and he has zero uh, sympathy for supporting the Ukrainian war. Um uh, that's I can't that came out wrong for supporting the Ukrainians fighting against Russia's invasion. It's not a Ukrainian war. Um, uh, uh, Governor DeSantis from Florida just recently, um, everybody thinks that he's going to be a presidential candidate, too. Uh, he just recently flip flopped. So initially he supported military assistance to Ukraine. He just came out two days ago with a much more guarded position. Um, and I fear time might be on Putin's side. And that's why this year, in my opinion, is such so critical uh, that yeah. I think Ukrainians need a breakthrough this year. Um, and by the way, uh, Americans, I can't speak for Europeans, but but Americans like winners. Right. Uh, so so when in the fall of last year, when the counteroffensives were successful, a Ukrainian counter success, counter uh offenses were successful, support for the war went up. But as it settled into more of a stalemate, right, and just the mm -hmm. Battle of Bakhmut, uh, support for the war has gone down. So I think it's critical to maintain American support that the Ukrainians have some victories on the battlefield this year. I've spent uh, some time in the United States recently, and I've talked I've talked to different people, and um, I, I've noticed that there is... Uh, one one issue I, uh, that a bit um, worries me is many many Americans many uh, Americans with strategical thinking think that uh, actually the main rival the main potential threat and rival for America is China 
So, yes, you, uh, the victory for Ukraine is important. But at the same time, the, uh, the terrible defeat of Russia would turn Russia into Chinese client, into just uh, the, the peaceful um, supplier of uh, oil and energy uh, to China. So that would help uh, the main American uh, rival. So that's, that's a bit of a problem uh, with, uh, with comprehension of this war and the, the idea what, how Russia should look like after the war. Yeah, it's a good observation. You must have been talking to some smart Americans. Uh, but I, but I, I radically disagree with two kinds of arguments related to China. Uh, so there are those uh, in the Biden administration and in think tanks and within the Republican Party for sure that says China's the main enemy. We got to focus all of our energy on China. And so one, we shouldn't really care about Ukraine. And two, we need to peel Russia away so that they're not allies with China. I think two of those assumptions are, are false. First, uh, if we, God forbid, allow Putin a victory in Ukraine, that makes our problems with China worse, not better. Because Putin will feel more emboldened, uh, Xi Jinping will feel more emboldened, uh, and, and it'll feel like America's in decline and the West is in decline. Um, and all the countries in the world that are kind of standing on the sidelines, they're going to lean just a little bit more towards China and Russia if Putin wins. Um, I was in Taiwan recently. I was in Taiwan last August. And every single meeting I had from that we had a delegation there, uh, and we met with everybody, uh, expressed the fear that if Putin wins in Ukraine, that will embolden Xi Jinping to attack uh invade taiwan um and that is not in america's national security interests so if you're a hawk on china you need to defeat putin in order to raise the costs and 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 raise the doubt in xi jinping's mind about invading taiwan by the way that's why it's so important to, to do more on the sanctions front today so that xi jinping has to think about maybe he will face sanctions if he invades taiwan but number two, the, the other part, the assumption that is wrong, is there is this naive belief among people that, but I don't think understand Putin very well, that somehow if if the war ends, we can reach out to him and pull him away from Xi Jinping and, you know, do what Nixon did with China during the, so the Cold War, which is peel them away and then Russia is going to join an alliance against China. That okay. is naive beyond belief as far as I'm concerned, because Putin is super paranoid about the West. Um, he thinks we're, we're going to try to overthrow him no matter what nice words we say to him. Whereas Xi Jinping, uh, he's also an autocrat. And, and they have a common fear of color revolutions and liberal democracies. Uh, and there's no amount of diplomacy that is going to change that. So I, I think that's fool's gold to think we're somehow going to pull Russia into our camp against China, it's never going to happen. Let me ask you a question about, about Georgia. Recently, you, uh, uh, you've, you said that uh, um, there is an important to start um, the worldwide campaign uh, for uh, former President Mikhail Saakashvili. Uh, what's your assessment? What's, what's happening with the Georgian authorities? Why are uh, why Georgia that um, claims that it's the uh, a lie of the West that uh, it wants to be uh, to become the part of uh, the European Union. At the same time, is um, trying to make a, uh, uh, looks like it's Russian made uh, or like it looks like Russian Russian law against foreign agents. At, at the same time, treats uh, former President Saakashvili as Putin treats uh, Alexei Navalny. What ha what has happened to Georgia? Is it still an American ally or it's now a Putin's ally? Well, I think it's a real tragedy uh, because, you know, there was real hope for Georgia after Saakashvili became president. And he did a lot of transformative things inside his country, real reforms, pushing Georgia towards uh, Europe. Uh, he also made a lot of mistakes, let's be clear. Um, and we shouldn't we should acknowledge those mistakes. Uh, but the current uh party in power georgia dream and their their main leader mr ivanashvili 
Uh, they're pushing Georgia away from Europe, away from democracy, and towards Russia's sphere of influence. There's just no question in my mind that that's the, the trajectory they're on. Now, they're not so strong, right? So there still is independent media. There still is independent civil society, opposition leaders. So they're pushing at a slower pace than they probably want to. Um, and as we've seen recently, when they tried to adopt Mr. Putin's law on foreign agents, and, and people sometimes compare it to America's law, it has nothing to do with, we have something called the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Uh, it has nothing to do with that law. It's very different. It's like Putin's law. It's a way to shut down uh, civil society. Uh, we saw major protests against it, and maybe those will be successful in pushing it back. So there's churn there, but but it's uh, the general direction, I think, is is a, in a negative way. Um, and with respect to Mr. Saakashvili, I would just say uh, what I say to, to members of the Georgian government, as well as others uh, in civil society. Um, again, he made mistakes, and we should not we should not forget those mistakes. Uh, but if he God forbid, dies in jail. That means that forever, the country of Georgia will be remembered for that one fact. They'll be remembered as the guy that put their previous president in jail and killed them there. Um, and most Americans have no idea where Georgia is. They don't know anything about Georgia. You know, we have they our know, own state. In, they know another Georgia, yeah. Yeah, they know another Georgia. But that that will be the one fact forever that Georgia will be remembered by in the United States and Europe. And, and in, even if you're Mr. Ivan Ashvili and, and loyal to him, uh, if you have any pride in your own country, you don't want to be remembered for that one horrible fact. And that's why I just think it's in Georgia's national interest, not for Democrats or autocrats, but all Georgians, all patriotic Georgians to release Mr. Saakashvili let him go to Ukraine or somewhere else. Uh, don't let him die in jail. But why President Biden and uh, Chancellor Scholz cannot put the same pressure as uh, Chancellor Merkel and President Obama put on the uh, Russian authorities to save uh, Khodorkovsky? It's a great question. Um, I've pushed, as you said, I've written a, a piece in the Washington Post explaining it. I've talked to very senior Biden administration officials about this issue. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if they're trying and failing or whether they're they're not trying. I, I honestly don't know the answer. To come to the end, a uh, question about history. Mm, you are well, you're the historian. I'm not a historian. Yes. Yeah, I'm but, uh, a question about history. It's, it's a recent history you were a part of and uh, the participant of. Uh, you are known as the architect of uh, reset button and all the all that policy. Uh, what's your what's your position on on that part of uh, Russian American history? Was it a mistake to start that to go uh, that path, or it was just um, it was the right uh, intention, but um, something that that did not work out? Um, yeah, the the policy that was that that meant to be successful, but that was like an illusion that uh, that could not uh, come true. Yeah, it's a big, hard question. Uh, I wrote a whole book about it because uh, I had to think about it so hard. And I was looking for your books. That's why yeah, I, yeah. I looked around. <laughs> they're, they're in my office here somewhere. Um, or maybe one of my research assistants has them right now because we're citing you in the new book I'm writing. Um, so let me, let me say two things about the reset. Number one, in my personal view, right? I don't, I can't speak for President Obama or... Secretary Clinton, uh, they'll let them speak for themselves. So Obama's written about it in his book. But in my personal view, uh, what we were seeking to do uh, with President Medvedev, remember he was a president, not Putin, we were seeking to cooperate on issues that were good for the United States of America. Um, I think many people uh, believe that we were trying to have good relations with Russia. Uh, and hold hands and sing Kumbaya and everybody, you know, uh, are, isn't it great? That was never my view. That was never what I was trying to do. I was trying to do two things, three things all together. Number one, advance our interests. And in my view, we did that. Uh, we wanted to replace the old START treaty 
with the New START Treaty to reduce the number of nuclear weapons in the world. We signed that treaty. You can't sign the START Treaty uh, without talking to the Russian government, right? You can't you can't go to you can't go to Poland, uh, you can't go to Mexico to negotiate the New START Treaty. You got to go to Moscow. Uh, we did that. Uh, number two, we wanted to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. That was a high priority for us in 2009. And you can't have United Nations sanctions against Iran without talking to, in this case, Medvedev. We did that. In 2010, we negotiated the most comprehensive sanctions against Iran ever. Medvedev supported that, UN Security Council Resolution 1929. Third, we wanted to increase our war effort inside Afghanistan, and at the same time, go after terrorists in Pakistan. Uh, whether that was the right policy or not, that's not my area of expertise, but I know that that was a top priority for our government. And so we wanted to increase the supplies of our soldiers through the north to Afghanistan and reduce our supply routes uh, through Pakistan. And when I came into the government, 90%, I even have the map right here, Michel. Uh, here it is. It's a CIA map, but it's been in, yeah, declassified. Yeah. Um, um, so we wanted to decrease um, supplies through Pakistan, increase them through the north. You can't get to Afghanistan through the north without going through Russia. You just got to look at a map. Uh, that's called the Northern Distribution Network. And so we did that. Uh, we kept our air base open in Kyrgyzstan, even though Putin didn't want to, want it to be open. We negotiated with Medvedev. Uh, we increased our supply routes. We reduced it to Pakistan. And then in 2011, we violated the sovereignty of Pakistan and we killed Osama bin Laden. Um, uh, but we could do that because we didn't have 90% of our supplies going through Pakistan. And I could go on with more, but those are, I could go on with more instances, but you get mm -hmm. the flavor, right? All of these things were important for American national security interests, and they all required us to talk and then negotiate, in this case, with Medvedev to achieve them. Um, so I look at that and say, uh, those were positive achievements. But there was two more things that I wanted to do that not everybody in the U.S. government wanted to do. I want to be very clear about that. I believe that we could do those things and not check our values at the door when we talk to Medvedev and Putin. I believe that we could do those things by engaging with the Russian government, but also Russian society. That was my belief. It was an idea that I stole from Ronald Reagan and George Shultz, by the way. It wasn't my idea. It was their idea. Uh, and I convinced Obama of that idea, just so you know. I convinced him that we could do both at the same time. So when Obama came to Moscow in July 2009 for his first trip there, he met with Medvedev, spent the whole day with Medvedev. Uh, we then had breakfast with Putin. We spent four hours with him out at his Asabnyak, out at his house, uh, four hours. And then we spent the rest of the day with business people, uh, students, Resh, he spoke at the uh, New Economic School, uh, mm -hmm civil society leaders, and then he ended the day meeting with opposition figures. Um, Boris Nemtsov was there, Gennady Zuganov was there. I, I was at all those meetings because that was my idea. We could do both at the same time. That turned out not to be true. That's the part that was wrong, that we, we could not do at the same time because Putin looked at that and he was threatened by that. And then he looked at Medvedev, you know Medvedev better than I do, uh, and he looked at Medvedev as becoming too pro-Western, too pro-Reset, too pro-Doge TV. Um, and the peak of that was in the Arab Spring in 2011, when we wanted to use force in Libya to stop what we thought was going to be genocidal slaughter in Benghazi. Uh, but we wanted to do it with UN Security Council support. So I flew with then Vice President Biden to Moscow to talk to Medvedev about the, about the use of force in Libya. And you know what? He agreed with us. I was in the room. He may deny it now because Medvedev today is a very pathetic figure, right? He's, yeah. I don't know what quite, the hell's going on with him. Quite a different person. 
Yeah, he's a very different person. And I know people close to him that that say he's really changed. Uh, I don't follow him anymore, but I was in the Kremlin in his office when he agreed with Vice President Biden about the use, about not abstaining, about not blocking our use of force. And I sat in the room with Putin the next day when Putin said, no way can you ever do that, right? So there was real division between them. Um, and then that's when then then Putin, I think, just decided, you know, Medvedev's gone too far. Uh, I've got to I've got to rein in these Americans. And then, you know, the end of the reset had nothing to do with us. It had everything to do with Russians in Russia. Uh, it, 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 it was all about Bolotna. It was all about uh, the protests uh, about a falsified vote that that Putin blamed us for. And I was on the what? phone call when he did it. Uh, I, I talked to him when he did it. He said, you guys are trying to overthrow me uh, and I'm going to stop you. And that's when everything... that, he, he, uh, he told that to Secretary Clinton or to President Obama. Well, Who? let me be more, let me be precise. Um, he, he I was in the room when I, I became ambassador. I was in the room when he told it to Mr. Donilon and uh, Secretary um uh, Secretary Kerry after after Clinton, when he said, you guys are trying to, uh, you know, and he pointed right at me, he stared right at me uh, twice, where he stared right at me and he said, I know what you're doing and we are going to stop you. Uh, and I want to be honest, it was, it was kind of scary to have Putin stare at you that way. Um, one time it was at his house and my bodyguards were on the other side of the fence. His were all around. I, I'm joking, but but only a little bit. But the moment, uh, it was actually he when it was clear to me, it was clear to me the reset ended when Putin announced on September 24, 2011, that he was going to run for president. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I briefed Obama to say that. Uh, that was it. It was obvious to me. That was even before parliamentary elections, before Bolotna. It was just clear as day to me. Clear, I'm clear to a lot of people, by the way. Uh, I remember what Arkady Dvorakovich tweeted that day. It was pretty clear to him, I think, too. But after there were the demonstrations, Secretary Clinton uh, released a statement about those parliamentary elections uh, that was critical, uh, that they were not done in a free and fair way. Uh, and Misha, I don't think I've talked about this anywhere else, but I, it's enough time. I think it's okay to talk about it. Uh, I was the White House official that cleared that statement, right? They sent it over to me. Um, you, you may have heard of him. His, his name is Jake Sullivan. He's now the National Security Advisor. Jake sent it to me. I got it on my BlackBerry. I remember very vividly, I was at my son's football game. So I had to go find a quiet place to get on the phone with him. And so I approved it on behalf of the White House, this statement. I didn't think it was that you know, it was just kind of a normal statement, but it wasn't normal because there were protests in Moscow. Um, and so a few days later, uh, Medvedev, on behalf of Putin, called Obama, and I was on that call. Uh, it was at the White House. I was still working at the White House. I hadn't gotten to Moscow. And he said very clear, remember, Putin said by issuing that signal, by issuing that statement, Clinton had sent a signal to the protesters to go out on the streets of Moscow, which is, of mm -hmm. course, absurd, but that's that's his mindset, um, and it is his real mindset. Um, a few days later, Medvedev called Obama and said, does Secretary Clinton speak for you, Barack, or was she just doing that on her own? Because he was trying to get, you know, to try to divide us over that, and it was very clear. I never heard uh, I've only heard Medvedev that uh, animated twice in life. One was on that phone call. Uh, once was after we had used force in Libya, and he was really mad at Obama that that Gaddafi had died in Libya. Um, and that was, you know, that was Kanyets. That was the end. That that was clear that there was no. Uh, we're going to have a very difficult time working with Mr. Putin uh, moving forward. I even thought about not going to Moscow as ambassador, by the way, because uh, I knew it was going to be uh, 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 just a, a difficult uh, time. Uh, but Obama rightly decided, you know, uh, that would be um, we're not going to capitulate. Uh, your job is to represent 
the United States of America in Russia. Your job is not to be friends with Putin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, throughout my time as ambassador, Obama reminded me of that uh, many times, that uh, uh, he was my boss, not Mr. Putin. And um, everything I said and did uh, as ambassador was uh, on behalf of, of the Obama administration, not on behalf of Mike McFaul. I clearly remember, it was probably 2008 or maybe nine, uh, the first years of, of President Medvedev, I had a very long conversation with uh, legendary Ludmila Alexeyeva, the famous uh, Soviet dissident, Russian dissident, uh, the, the head of Helsinki um, uh, com committee. And she, and she was very mm, hopeful. She, she was full of hope about uh, President Medvedev and her her position was was like that. She she said we must support him because he's our own chance. He's the only person who can fire Putin. So if he feels our support, if he feels that the whole world supports him, one day probably he will fire Putin, and that's going to be our victory. But if we criticize him on a daily basis, he, we will will push him towards Putin, and he will never he will never do anything bold. Do you think there was that that opportunity? Do you think that there was some kind of mischance that you could have uh, supported Medvedev or pushed him uh, towards that fatal fatal to Putin the, the decision that that he uh, he could be uh, he, he could feel himself independent enough, respected enough, leader enough to to be bold to fire Putin. Well, let me tell you one story and then answer that question. Um, so when I was a U.S. ambassador, uh, the state controlled media in Russia frequently said that I was sent by Obama to foment revolution and that I was handing out money uh, to the opposition, um, uh, which was completely false. Uh, by the way, I had way more United Russia uh, members of parliament to my house at Spasa House in opposition. Uh, Zhirinovsky even came to one of my parties, but that, you know, those are the facts. I remember that, I remember yes, that. I, yes, I was so there. I, you were there, <laughs> July 4th. Uh, the only, there was only one time when I met with the collective opposition and it was for five minutes. The only one time it happened was at Medvedev's house. Because mm -hmm. we were coming in, I was bringing a senator to meet with President Medvedev, and on the way out was the entire opposition, the left wing, you know, the hardcore, I think Udaltsov was there, and and Nemtsov, and, and they were all there, and they were meeting with Nemtsov, they were meeting with Medvedev, right? And when they saw me, uh, Nemtsov, he's always, as you remember, he was always gregarious, and oh, Mike, but a lot of them ran away. They didn't want to get a photograph with <laughs> Tom. That was the only time I met collectively with the opposition. Um, to your hard question, I, I, my guess is probably no, um, but but Medvedev didn't try. Uh, you know, I think he could have tried. Um, he just, you know, he could have run for president against Putin in the fall of 2011. He didn't just have to uh, be his flunky, uh, but he just didn't have the courage to do that. Uh, and so uh, I think in retrospect, um, uh, that that was not possible. Had he, you know, I, I think about this sometimes. Had the Arab Spring not happened, and Bolotnaya, and and the you know Putin become super paranoid again, would he allowed Medvedev to run for a second term? I don't. That's a more interesting question, right? And just stayed yeah. in place, uh, and then allowed Medvedev more power to maybe dismiss Putin. Uh, my guess is probably not. Uh, but I do wonder about that sometimes. Uh, but obviously, don't know the answer to that question. He's a deeply disappointing figure to me. I have to say mm -hmm. that. Yeah, uh, because I sat in many meetings with Medvedev. I know, I, I probably had more meetings with him than any other American. Um, uh, uh, you know, even sometimes, even without Obama. We met and I remember running into him in, in Hawaii at an APEC meeting. And the things he said about what his vision was and what he says now, uh, there's nobody who uh, has reversed himself uh, more disgracefully, I would say, than Medvedev. It's one thing to have believed that all the way through, right? 
And I have, you know, I have propagandist Putin types that they've been on his payroll and they've been working for him forever. That's that's one thing. OK, I got it. I, I understand. Um, and the ones that do it cynically, you know, uh, just because M- Misha Leontov, a great example. Right. OK, you you sold out. I got it. You're like, no hard feelings. Yeah, you called me all this shit. I, they, you saw you called me all this stuff on TV, Misha. I get it. You're just you just sold out for money. Uh, but Medvedev, he was saying something different compared to now, and and I find people like him to be much more tragic of all. Thank you, Michael. That was a terrific. Let's do it again. All right, let's do it again. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.